If you'll take your Bibles this morning, as Mariah comes up, and open them to 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2. For you, brothers and sisters, become Im imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. This is... They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Thank you, Mariah. Good morning. Hope everyone is doing well this morning. Looking forward to warmer weather later this week. Good time of spring. You know, today I'm going to be talking part two as we prepare for Christian persecution. And as I said in part one, this has two meanings. This is persecution as Christians and also persecution, quote, by Christians. And I put, quote, because there's some people that call themselves Christians that are not really of Christ. And we know this, and it's unfortunate. You know, I don't know, we've had AOA recently, the Academy of Arts, which puts on great biblical productions, a lot of times based on true stories and uh, missionaries and martyrs throughout history. And two years ago, we did Queen Jane. Now, Queen Jane is a very interesting story because England had broken away from the Pope and the Church of Rome. And one of the reasons they broke away was because that they started to translate the Bible into English. And people started to read the Word of God, and they, say, they saw all that was wrong with the Catholic Church. And many of those people that translated the Bible were killed for translating the Bible. Now, after Queen Jane lost power, her sister, or niece, I forget the exact relation, but cousin, yeah, you're right, it's cousin, sorry about that, but her name was Mary. Does anybody know what she was known as? She was known as Bloody Mary. And why was she known as Bloody Mary? Well, it turns out Mary wanted to bring the church back under Rome, the England church, the Church of England and the people. And so there were a lot of Bible-believing Christians killed for that cause. And I'm going to tell you a story today to start about Dr. Ridley and Mr. Lattimore. Now, these two would not convert to Catholicism. They would not go along with the Catholic Mass, and they would not admit that the Pope was the vicar of Christ, which was all good things. They stood on the Word of God. Um, they were given a chance. All they had to do was go along. All they had to do was take Mass. All they had to do was admit that the Pope was the Vicar of Christ. But they would not. They stood on the Word of God. Now, these two men were therefore executed. They were led out to be burnt at the stake. As they were on their way out, they prayed for each other. And they praised the Lord. In fact, Dr. Ridley helped them fasten the metal belt that was put around him to keep him there at the stake so that he could be burnt to death. They also put gunpowder around their neck so that when the flame reached up to their head, it would help them go a little quicker. Now, folks, this is for standing on the word of God. This is four or five hundred years ago not that long ago, in the mid to late 1500s. Now, Lattimore and Ridley both said, spoke loudly and said, Lord, I give my soul to thee. It is in your hands. And both of them were praising God. Now, Lattimore, the flames reached up, and he seemed to want to take the flames and embrace them because he knew he was going to be with Christ. And he actually died pretty quickly and seemingly without much pain. But Dr. Ridley had a different story. Because the five flames were not reaching high enough, somebody threw more branches on the fire. And what happens when you throw too many on? 
It, yeah, it doesn't. It, it keeps him down. So we don't know how long for sure he stood there burning from the waist down, but it could have been 30 to 40 minutes. And the whole time, he kept praising God, crying out to the Lord, not crying out and asking for help, but crying for the flame to take him. He was ready to give his life to the Lord. Eventually, they were able to get the flame up, and he gave his life to the Lord. And I think someday, when we get to heaven, we'll get to meet Dr. Ridley and Sir Lattimore, who gave their life for the truth. When we think about Christ, Christian persecution and we think about the persecution, it's not as bad as that yet, is it? But that gives us a mark to meet. These men were willing to give their lives. They could have lied. They could have just went along to get along. It would have been easy. You know, any religion that's going to kill someone for not believing, I would say, is a good sign. It's what? A false religion. But they endured Christian persecution. And we talked last time about what persecution is. It's hostility and ill treatment, especially because of race or politics or religious beliefs. And there are all kinds of persecutions that go on in our world. And we know that not all persecution is equal. We have to make a distinction between general persecution and persecution for righteousness which is mainly what we're talking about today. When we think about Jesus on that Palm Sunday, we know that he went and sacrificed, but what happened to him? He was persecuted, was he not? And put to death in a horrible manner. He faced persecution for being righteous. Dr. Ridley and, and Sir Lattimore faced persecution for being righteous. Now, there are other persecutions, as we talked about last time. You know, gangs persecute each other, but it's not for righteousness' sake. We see sects of Islam persecute each other, but it's not for righteousness' sake. Um, and we talked about the Mormons, how they uh, claim persecution, but again, it was not for righteousness' sake. False teachers and false doctrines have been around and will be persecuted, but it's not for righteousness' sake. And remember, we talked about how these false teachers will claim that they're being persecuted whenever somebody calls them out for their false teaching. We used Benny Hinn as an example last week. But this week, let's use the Pharisees as an example of false teachers. Jesus held them accountable for their teachings. And what happened? What did the Pharisees think of Jesus? Don't we see in Matthew 9, verses 33 through 34, that the Pharisees said, And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying it was never so seen in Israel. So the people are admiring Jesus and can't believe the miracles. What did the Pharisees say? But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. They were calling Jesus, what? A false prophet of the devil. Now, Jesus being righteous, what did he call the Pharisees? The Pharisees said, we have our father Abraham. Jesus says in John 8, 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Did the Pharisees not end up being murderers? Yes. They murdered Jesus. Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. He called them out. So when we talk about where does perse uh, persecution come from, we talked last time about the civil authorities. Now let's talk about the religious leaders here today as we think about Palm Sunday and leading up to what happened to Jesus. And you know, often religious leaders work hand in hand 
with the civil authority. You're going to see this all throughout history, how they can burn people at the stake. Well, obviously, the civil authorities have to be going along with them when they're doing these things. For example, we see Judas in John 18.3. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. We see the Pharisees working together with the authorities to come get Jesus. Mark 14.43, the same thing. Cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Elders. You know, I pray that it would never be said that Dry Run sent out a band with knives and guns to go gather somebody up. There's a different way as Christians that we're to handle things, correct? And let's talk a minute about why did the religious leaders hate Jesus. You see, the Pharisees would be the most pristine Bible scholars of their day. They would be the most popular teachers on television, if we're going to equate it to today. These would be the ones that would say, I know all the Greek and Hebrew, and, um, you know, well, I am the Bible scholar. You must listen to me. So why did they hate Jesus so much? It's really not the people we see ever hating Jesus, is it? It always seems to be the religious leaders. Well, let's look, because I think there's four reasons we can see in Scripture of why they hated Jesus. Starting in John 7, uh, verses 11 through 13, Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? Among their, uh, and there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said he was a good man. Others say nay, but he deceiveth the people. How bet no man spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews? Now, I hope there's no one that doesn't speak openly for fear of me as a leader or of Devin or of any of the other leaders here, that there would be fear to speak openly. Think about that. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. You see, Jesus didn't go to the right college. Jesus was self-taught just from the word of God. He didn't go to the Pharisee school. The Pharisees thought, certainly the Son of God would be with them, would go to their schools and be taught and learn. Remember when he's 12, he's with the Pharisees and scribes and they can't believe the knowledge that Jesus already contains and he's self-taught. You know, we have the same thing today. If you didn't go to seminary, how dare you tell us anything about the Bible? As if you have to have a degree in one of their schools to know the Bible. And you can't read the Bible for yourself. We might as well go back to the Catholic priests, if that's the case, where they read it to us in a different language. But no, they didn't like Jesus because he wasn't one of them. He didn't go to their school. He didn't learn the same way they did. And they held it against them. And that happens today, folks. We're going to see all of these happen today. Let's look at John 7. Uh, starting in verse 45, for the second reason. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? Now remember, the Pharisees had sent out their underlings to go gather Jesus and bring him back, to trick him into saying the wrong thing. And here's what they said. The officers answered, Never a man spake like this. Now this infuriated the Pharisees. Then answered them, the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Notice what happened. None of the big shot religious leaders believed on him. You know, just because none of the television big shots talk about something or have a different opinion, like when we talk about the timing of the rapture and things like that, doesn't mean they're right and we're wrong. 
All right. It, it'd probably be more scary if all the big shots, we agreed with everything they said. That would be more scary. But just because it's not what the big time pastors say doesn't mean it's true or not true. It's what the word of God says that makes it true or not true. So they use this as a reason. And then they basically say, nobody understands the law but us there at the end, if you caught that. Certainly, you just don't understand the law. Which the truth is, if they would understood the law, they would have known who Jesus was. So they didn't understand the law. But again, it's the same thing. He's not, none of us have believed on him, so that means he's false. You know, don't make me go through all the times the majority is wrong. By the way, later this week, 2,000 years ago, the majority said crucify him. Were they right? No. So be very careful. In fact, it's scary when you're in agreement with the majority in this world. that You, you might want to recheck what you're agreeing to. The third thing, then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees. And this is right after Lazarus was raised from the dead in John 11, in verse 45, starting verse 45, and told them the things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. So they're not happy that Jesus is doing miracles. Look at this. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest the same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. Now look and listen to this valiant man's decision. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Now what a coward. Okay, now he's supposed to be the head high priest, leader of the Jews. How's he going to save the nation? Not, not sacrifice himself. Not, not me do anything. Let's kill this other man that the people are believing on. Another third reason which people don't usually realize is they wanted to stay in power. Now, there's a parable that Jesus tells them about the husbandmen that have the vineyard. And when he sends his son, what do they say? They say, well, if we kill his son, we'll get the inheritance. And they drag him out of the city. See, they didn't want the son of God to come. They should have known the son of God when he came. They're supposedly the experts. Why didn't any of them realize who Jesus was? They didn't want somebody to come and take their spot because they would have to get behind the Son of God, right? And they would have to give up their power. They wanted to stay in power. They were the religious leaders. So this is the third reason that they hated Jesus because he knew they knew that he threatened their position. They didn't know that God was using them to fulfill his will. But let's look at one more reason. And this is from John 12. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Folks, what a sad world where you're more interested in the praise of men than you are in the praise of God. You know, when I was talking about the timing of the rapture, there's a lot of pastors that agree with what I've taught, but they won't say a word in their church. You want to know why? Because they know it's not popular. They know they won't be invited to the big conference that they have to speak. They know that they'll have people that might leave the church because they tell them the truth and they don't agree with it. They know because they desire the praise of men. God help us when we desire the praise of men and to stay in power and because nobody else 
that's on TV or big time agrees with it, or because they didn't get the learning that some of these so-called Bible scholars got, that we're not going to listen to the truth. And a lot of times we know the Pharisees are the bad guys, but I don't think we realize who the Pharisees are today. If you're more interested in my credentials, if you're more interested in being on the circuit, all of these people, they have their own little clubs and they come to each other's church and they sell their books and they do all this, which by the way, we're not to be a house of merchandise, are we? And, you know, you're not welcome to their club. And I wouldn't want to be in it because I think you got to sell your soul basically to get in that club. Because you're more interested in the things of this world and the praise of men. But this is why they hated Jesus. Jesus didn't, wasn't one of them. He didn't go along with them. He called them out. I have some other scriptures listed. Read them. Read Matthew 23. Jesus knew their heart. Their heart was all about the show. Their heart was all about playing church, not being a church. Religious leaders are central to persecution. Think about Acts 24, starting in verse 1. And let's see what happened to Paul uh, when he was being persecuted. After five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy province, we accept it always and in all places most noble Felix with all thankfulness. So first he's buttering this guy up. He's saying, oh, you're so great. And, you know, remember what the Pharisees did and said, oh, a Pilate, you know, these people are trying to create, Jesus is trying to create trouble and trying to make it seem like they're pleading to them and their greatness. Notwithstanding that I be not farther tedious unto thee, I pray ye that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. So finally... After all of this um, buttering him up, we finally get to to tell us, telling us what he says. Now listen to what he calls Paul. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. Folks, they're calling him basically terrorists. They're calling Paul like he's some kind of terrorist. Do we see this today? The people that stand on the truth, that go against the mainstream, whatever it be. Are they not being labeled as horrible people and terrorists and racists and all kinds of other things? Anybody that doesn't go along, they just start calling them names. Well, guess what? Paul suffered the same thing. And we see here the religious leaders sent their man to go in and try to get Paul killed. That's basically what they wanted to do was kill Paul for just teaching Christianity. The scripture we read today that Moriah read for us, for ye brethren become followers of the churches of God within Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God. And are contrary to all men. That's some pretty strong words right there by Paul, is it not? Um, anybody that says the Romans killed Jesus, that's not true. That's not scriptural. The Jews had Jesus killed. They said, let his blood be on us and our children. That's pretty clear. Who wanted Jesus killed? Pilate said, I wash my hands of this. This man's innocent in my sight. 
forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Folks, listen, the worst thing you can do is not only to stop somebody from teaching the Word of God, but to keep other people from hearing it, that they might get saved and go to heaven. That's what these Jews were doing, and the Gentiles that were against the people that were in Thessalonica, because they were facing persecution from their people, which is what Paul's comparing it to. Listen, the Jews came under wrath after Jesus, because they rejected Jesus. The reason Jerusalem was destroyed and they have been spread throughout the uttermost is because they rejected Jesus. And we got to be clear when understanding that. And now for the last thing that we need to do with this persecution, we need to prepare for betrayal. Who betrayed Jesus? Judas. Judas was one of his twelve. Judas saw all the miracles. Judas heard all the teachings of Jesus. As far as we know, Judas went out with another disciple when he sent them out and did miracles. In Jesus' name. One of his own. One of his friends. And he betrayed him. How many have ever heard of Mephibosheth? It's a fun name, isn't it? Aren't you glad your parents didn't name you Mephibosheth? Imagine trying to spell that in first grade. How do you spell that? I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son. And as they were fleeing, when Saul and Jonathan died, he was dropped and he was crippled in his legs from being dropped. Now, Jonathan and David were best friends. They had a special bond. And they, Jonathan and David, swore to each other that they would always protect each other and their house. So after David established his throne, he said, Is there any left of Jonathan? And they brought Mephibosheth to him. And he said to him, Listen, take all of Saul's land and restore it to Mephibosheth. He said, not only that, but you will eat bread with me every day. And I will make sure that you have bread and that you have your land restored and that the servants will till and work the land for you. This is what David did for Mephibosheth to honor his promise to Jonathan. But you know what Mephibosheth did to David after all of this? When Absalom, his son, took power tried took power from David and tricked him and went behind his back and got all the people. Mephibosheth went with Absalom in his own house, ate his own bread, betrayed him. This is going to happen, and we read about it in Scripture. We look at Luke 21, 16 through 17, And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brother and king folks and friends and some shall they cause to be put to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Folks, being a Christian in today's world does not make you popular. We have this false perception that somehow, uh, because we're Christians, everyone's going to love us. If we just display the right thing. No, if we stand on truth, you get burnt at the stake. You get persecuted. Now that doesn't mean we're being hateful or mean, but that means we stand on the word of God and we don't bend. Listen, folks, without Jesus, everyone else is going to a bad place. They're going to hell. And we need to get them that word. That's not trying to be accepting and make everybody our friend. That's trying to get people saved. Some are saved by just hearing the word, and some are saved by the fire and hearing the results of not obeying Jesus. Our job is not to be the world's friend. Our job is to pull people out of the world and get them saved, get them to Jesus Christ. By trying to be just people's friend, 
you can be like just saying, yeah, and, and hell's right around the corner. And you're just like, yeah, maybe you don't want to go that way, but, you know, do what you want. If you really love someone, you're like, stop! That way is the wrong way. That is how a Christian should be. I woke you up, didn't I? Listen, folks, it should break your heart, especially loved ones. But just being like, you do what you want. You're not helping them. The world calls that loving, but that ain't being loving. Loving is to tell them the truth in love. You know, it saddens me because there are going to be people in our families, and we've seen this with the past two years. They're going to be mad at you if you don't go along with the rest of the world. If you're like, my hope is in Jesus Christ, or oh, you're stupid. Follow the signs. No, my hope is in Jesus Christ. I follow Jesus and his word. You follow whatever you want. But if you want to be right with God, you're going to follow his word. Matthew 10, starting in verse 34. Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. Folks, this is Jesus Christ saying this. Is there going to be peace on earth until Jesus returns? No. Remember, Jesus said when his mother and brother and sisters came, he said, these are my, this is my mother. These are my brother and sister. This is why it's so important that we're here for each other as a church. So that we do have people we can come to in a time of need. And some of you may have a great mother and father and Christian mother and father. But let me tell you, there's a lot of people that don't. There's a lot of people that would love to have some of the mother and fathers that we have. If you do, you're blessed. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loses his life shall, for my sake, shall find it. How many churches are teaching that? Does that sound like healthy, wealthy, and wise? How many people put God above their family? And listen. That does not mean that your family is not important. But God needs to be first. That's the first commandment. There is no other God before me. If you're going to church because it's where your son or daughter wants to go and not because it's where you feel God should have you, then you're not putting God first. Just being honest. You know, the real problem that I saw in today, church, is that many love their lives here more than the truth. Do you think Dr. Ridley and Sir Lattimore love their life more than the truth? Do you think all the prophets and disciples and Jesus we know Jesus didn't, but all of those that followed him, do you think they loved their lives more than the truth? This is why they're going to hate us. Just go along. Just say it's okay. Just agree with us, and you it will let you be. Let 
It's so easy to just go along with the world because that's the enemy, what he wants. You know, I've really been praying for God to help me hate sin and hate the things of this world so that they don't. I'm not saying that I'm perfect and that I got this all figured out. I struggle. We all struggle. I'm not up here better than anyone else. Trust me. But we need to try to love the things of God and hold them higher than the things of this world. The things of this world will let you down over and over again. God will not let you down. And I'd rather spend an eternity with God than have a couple things I want in this world go right. It's not even close, but we tend to not we tend to think that the couple things in this world are more important than our eternity most of the time. So how should we respond? And we're we're Getting to the end here, let's look at how the disciples responded in Acts 5. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we did we did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in his name? And they're talking about Jesus. And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intent to bring this man's blood upon us. Well, rightfully so. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. And talk about bold. Listen to what Peter said in front of them. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart, and they took counsel to slay them. Again, all Peter and them had to do was say, we won't talk about it, and leave. Now, they didn't end up slaying them. What did they end up doing? And we're going to see that they actually rejoiced in this, Um, They were actually talked out of slaying them, and they said, uh, let us see. If it dies out on its own, we'll know it's not of God. But we pick up here, and to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, what? Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. First Peter 4.16 Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory God on this behalf. You know, sometimes we've been lucky that we live in a free country. Well, semi-free. But you know what? The Bible says you're lucky if you suffer persecution for Jesus Christ. The Bible says rejoice when men will hate you for standing on his word and on the name of Jesus Christ. And let's finish with Matthew 5. We see the Sermon on the Mount, and this is pretty much at the beginning. What does Jesus say? Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And what's it say? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Folks, we need to prepare. We need to prepare spiritually. Is what I'm talking about more than physically. I'm not saying build a bomb shelter and, you know, do all that stuff. If you want to, go ahead. But I'm talking about spiritually being prepared. Being prepared to stand on what you believe when others will ridicule you 
Oh, you're so dumb. You don't follow the science. Oh, you're so dumb. You don't understand that I feel this way. Oh, you're hateful because you won't agree with my lifestyle. We're going to be made out to be the bad guy. We need to be prepared spiritually not to, because if we react to that in just calling them names back, does that make us stand for Christ? No. We're going to say, listen, I believe in this. I trust in this. What do you trust in? Do you know all these scientists can't tell you where you're going when you die? But this can. This has the answer. This has the most important answers. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word and your truth. And we thank you as we come to this time of year. We thank you for sending your son. And we thank Jesus for enduring all the persecutions and humiliation and everything else that he endured, endured to die for us. And we didn't deserve it, dear Lord, but you did it anyway. You sent him because your desire is that all would repent and come to you. And dear Lord, I just ask if there's anyone here today that, that needs to get right with you, that they would feel the opportunity to come and surrender their life to you, dear Lord. That is the hope. You are the only hope. Your son is the only hope. You are the hope that the world needs. Dear Lord, just be with everyone here in our service tonight, dear Lord, that as we prepare for this time, this coming, we can come together as a fellowship, come together as brother and sisters, and lean on each other. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.